All right, as people trading in, let me just get started. So welcome everyone to today's talk by Dr. Larry Ward about his new book, America's Racial Karma. I am Jessica Zhu, Assistant Professor of Religion and Instructor of the course on Engage Buddhism, for which uh, we are honored to have Dr. Ward as our um, guest speaker. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that today is a very auspicious day. Um, if you celebrate Vaishak, the Buddha's birthday in East Asia, you know that it happens on the lunar calendar of the um, on the eighth day of the fourth month. For many Buddhists living in a Christian um, nation, they don't have the luxury to take a week off, and it's also difficult to organize spiritual lives around the lunar calendar in the modern world. So some of my Asian American Buddhist friends decided to celebrate April 8th as the American Vesak Day. Uh, it's definitely not mainstream, but happy Vesak anyway. So on this important day of peace, generosity, kindness, and compassion, it is said that good actions or bad actions are multiplied. I hope Dr. Ward's insight will bring all of us countless good karmas so we can bring forth um, revolutionary change together. One last thing before we begin. Um, I'd like to thank East Asian Studies Center and School of Religion and their staff members for generous sponsorship and support in making this happen. This includes um, EASC's Associate Director Grace Liu, Program Officer Jasmine Yu, um, and School of Religion Project Specialist and Webmaster John Otero, and Dr. Ward's assistant at the Lotus Institute, Kimberly Flesher, who helped to uh, you know, set up Zoom webinar technologies, flyers, event page, countless emails back and forth to hash out details. So thank you. Now the logistics. The seminar um, um, is a seminar format, right? To start with, Dr. Ward um, will lead us into a 10 minute guided meditation. Then he'll speak to us for about 20, 25 minutes. This is followed by a 30 minutes of question and answer. So during his talk, if you have a question, you can, um, if you want to ask him the question in person, you can raise your hand using the Zoom raise your function, uh, raise your hand function, or you can type your question in the Q&A box. Um, as the moderator, I'll go through these typed questions and read them out loud for you when it's your turn. Also, because Dr. Ward is the guest speaker for my course and my 20 students are required to read his book, so if they raise questions, I'm obliged to let them jump the queue. Thank you for your understanding. So finally, we are delighted to have Dr. Ward to speak with us about both his book and the mission of the Lotus Institute. As you may have known, Dr. Larry Ward is one of the co-founders of the Lotus Institute and a senior teacher in the tradition established by the renowned Zen master and activist, Thich Nhat Hanh. Venerable Titnaha is recognized as one of the founding fathers of engaged Buddhism. And in fact, he's the one who gave us this term, socially engaged Buddhism. Um, as for the mission of the Lotus Institute, here I just read an excerpt from the web, right? The Lotus Institute is an educational nonprofit that offers Buddhist mindfulness practice for activists, organizers, artists, parents, educators, healthcare professionals, and other service-oriented change makers seeking to build a radical love-filled future. Aware that collective care hinges on each individual's capacity to stay present, stable, and centered in love, we focus on sharing practices that nurture a healthy, resilient nervous system, bolster community, mitigate burnout, and increase creative capacities." Unquote. So mindfulness for collective healing, that's radical. Typically in mindfulness courses, online apps, teachers talk about training your mind, stress reduction, cultivating inner calm, quietness, tranquility. But today, Dr. Ward will speak to us a much more expensive kind of mind training, how to break America's cycle of racial karma through mindfulness. So let's welcome Dr. Ward and please lead us into meditation. Dr. Ward, you're on mute. 
Thank you for your kind invitation. It's my delight to be with you. Um, thank you, Professor Zhu, for your introduction and all the backup staff who worked to make this possible. My name is Larry Ward. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Kumeyaay and Lesotho peoples, also known as the Greater San Diego area. But I want to begin with a poem for you that arrived this morning. Tears for breakfast, sadness and fury in a daily dance. I cry witnessing your racialized suffering again and again. Breathing, I recognize your suffering as my own. Breathing, I sense your mystery, depth, and greatness, too, as my own. Breathing, I touch the ground of kinship running through my veins. Solidarity, solidarity, let's make it so. Solidarity. If you can find a posture that is comfortable for you to spend a few moments in, in meditation, in meaning by meditation, paying attention to a specific object of mind and body. And I want to uh, introduce a meditation practice that um, I created in Thailand years ago when I was working with an international school there. Um, and we were trying to think of a cool way to get kids involved in, in mindful breathing to start the day. And we came up with what we call take five. And so take five simply means being conscious of five breath cycles. One cycle of the in-breath, one cycle of the out-breath, one cycle of the in-breath, one cycle of the out-breath, et cetera. So if you uh, could bring your, your body into settling where you are, feeling yourself supported by the chair or cushion that you may be on or mat you may be on, and see if you can sense the gravity of the earth holding on to you. And let yourself sink into that your body feel that support underneath you that goes deep, deep, deep. And now the first breath cycle, the precious in breath, and the precious out breath. second breath cycle, the precious in-breath and the precious out-breath flowing, and the third breath cycle, the wonder of the in-breath and the wonder of the out-breath, the fourth breath cycle, Finding aliveness in the in-breath, touching aliveness in the out-breath. In the fifth breath cycle, finding stillness underneath the breath. And now resting in that awareness vitality and stillness and aliveness for a few moments in silence, still noticing the miracle of the in-breath and the out-breath happening in the now.
noticing your body sensations at this moment. Notice the most positive and nourishing sensations in your body. See if you can locate a place where it feels really good to be alive right now. breathing into that space of aliveness, of positivity in the best sense of the word and spreading that energy throughout your whole body. See if you can feel it moving, filling you up and then spilling out into history. bringing your attention back to the sensations in the room around you. You might want to do a, a 360 look around the room for colors and light and shadow and people and faces. Recognizing again where your body is at this moment. And thanking yourself for taking a few moments to be mindful of the wonder of your life. So this talk will be a very brief reflection um, on engaged Buddhism from from my my perspective and what engaged Buddhism uh, for me first raises the question of engaged in what and with what, engaged why. And at this moment of our life together, especially in the USA, we are in a historic moment of both breakdown and breakthrough. I'm still shocked by the planetary virus every day by COVID and it's stalking of human life around this planet. I am still traumatized and activated by the racial reckoning and tragedy and horror and brutality taking place in this land every day as it has for centuries. But underneath that all, in the midst of that all, there is a conscious drive for human and ecological sustainability, flourishing, and sanity. I want to explore a few, a few horizons, but I want to make a few notes to the ones who came before in the Buddhist tradition that set the stage for understanding of engaged Buddhism to be born. Thich Nhat Hanh quoted as saying, engaged Buddhism started taking shape when his peace activists during the Vietnam War, quote, when bombs begin to fall on people you cannot stay in the meditation hall all the time. That was not easy because traditionally the idea of engaged Buddhism was not yet born fully. But before Thich Nhat Hanh's language around engaged Buddhism, I think it's important to know and look back even further hundred years over that period you will find the language of humanistic Buddhism and it is both a history of philosophical thought going all the way back to the Buddha's presence and awakening in the world and activity in the world and uh, do research I suggest especially on uh, Chinese Buddhism you will find a, a unusual history of social action not just care for poverty, care for the downtrodden and orphanages, um, 
but also even moments of revolutionary zeal you can find in Buddhist history thousand years ago. Dari Long, who I studied with at the University of the West, quotes Grandmaster Xing Yun of Fo Guan Shan, it was Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddhists who first advanced humanistic Buddhism. The very idea that our humanity had value, whoever we were, and that Buddha nature was dwelling in us all, is the foundation of humanistic Buddhism and therefore engaged Buddhism. Another Chan master said, we seek not salvation by leaving the world, that there really is no difference between the world, this world, the world beyond, and sentient beings and Buddha. Grand Master Xing Yun went on further to say that Buddhists should work on the establishment of human life Buddhism. From human beings to bodhisattvas is the journey to Buddhahood. To transform our temples and places and homes so they become places of living practice as well as everything else and places of education and places of outreach and places of care and love and to build up a sangha a community of practice that transcends our differences this to me is our greatest opportunity at this moment in history in the United States for the first time anywhere most Buddhist traditions have a place here whatever those traditions are we can find them now here and so what could happen if how to find our kinship in the midst of our practice without losing our practice but enhancing enhancing our practice we live in what a recent author called a neuro existential crisis and simply what this means is that our nervous systems are not prepared to live in the world we have and why this is important in terms of engaged Buddhism is our practice of shamanta which is not superficial please there are many people who think shamanta is simply about being calm it depends what you mean by calm what the Buddha meant by calm was that you were so calm you fell into the well of equanimity in your heart and in your mind and in your behavior that's shamanta but the challenge before us as bodhisattvas in the world today is the next level of practice <laughs> samapadi which is how we take our stillness and equanimity cultivated on the cushion or walking meditation sitting meditation and other practices and chanting etc and embody that energy at home at school in the community on our streets in between our relationships with one another and turn that energy toward wellness and justice and belonging now this is what's underneath our crisis we see being acted out every day over and over again as the 500 years of cold western colonial legacy of xenophobia homophobia anti anything not really white male and a certain kind of white male in this land black phobia Asian phobia feminine phobia just I, I started making a list <laughs> I decided I needed to stop because it's all about the inability to be fully present with what we think is the other without recognizing that otherness is a perception itself 
just like our individual separate self is only a perception. So our meaning crisis, which we see being played out, and by meaning, I mean belonging. Where do I belong? Who do I belong with? Who am I safe with? Who will welcome me? Who will love me in the biggest sense of love? Then the crisis of purpose. What, what am I supposed to do with my life in this situation of racialized consciousness, constant trauma and reactivation of trauma? So my nervous system, your nervous system, our nervous system is living on hypervigilance. And hypervigilance in evolutionary terms is not designed to be a 24-7 state of human physiology or chemical activity. It only does damage when we're on alert all the time. And when we're on alert all the time, we can actually become addicted to the energies and chemicals that activate when we're on alert all the time, so much so that we don't, no longer know how not to be on alert. I remember working with some uh, young people in Chicago m many, many years ago, inner city youth, and some not so youthful, but uh, we did a retreat or a program, a school that we created but we held it in a rural area of Illinois outside of Chicago. And the first three days, the only comment from these young men and women at the time were, it is so quiet here. <laughs> For the first time, I heard my own thought. So adapting the practice, packaging the practice, creating different doors where many people as possible can be exposed. And I know there's the mech mindfulness uh, industry. I know there are people who think uh, that Buddhist practice is otherworldly only. And please remember in all these images of Buddhism itself, how our European interpretation of the Buddhist practice influences what we perceive it is or our American framework around Buddhist practice as we perceive. It is actually heard someone say uh, they thought mindfulness was created here in the United States. I mean, this is the height of arrogance and tragedy at the same time. What's the story of my life? But especially now, what's the story of our life together? How can we have a life together when we've been so conditioned to be apart? This really opens up the whole conversation for me about Sangha as practice, spiritual community as practice, practice communities. Whatever name we want to use is not nearly as important as the quality of activity that goes on in that space or at that time. This is so important in terms of engaged Buddhism. So for me, the first point is simply to understand our practice of meditation and contemplation is aligned with reorienting our entire nervous system and creating a nervous system that is capable of planetary living a nervous system capable of recognizing justice, injustice, a nervous system capable of resonating with love and kindness. That's mindfulness of the body going to deep levels. The second reason the Buddhist tradition in terms of engagement is so critical at this time in the world is our destabilization as the what we're most familiar with starts to well continues to deconstruct the uncertainty of the experience of identity 
is traumatic for people who thought they already had it. What the practice and the teachings of the Buddha Dharma offer that no other religious tradition does that I know of and I have studied and practiced in many contexts. David Loy's book, The Great Awakening, had the insight on why the Buddha Dharma is relevant now. And to quote, The Buddha's awakening deserves our attention because no other religious tradition foregrounds so clearly the crucial insight of the nature of our constructedness. Our individual constructedness, our social constructedness, and at a time when our constructedness is being revealed as human creation, not divine creation, as human creation, our racial pyramid of superiority and inferiority is a human creation. Now we see these things. We, then we look at our education system and our communities and our economics and start to see how much is conditioned. But it's not that alone that's important. We see that so that we can create our own reconditioning. And again, the Buddhist practice is just so genuine in its understanding. And for me, this is summarized in many ways in the Heart Sutra. <laughs> understanding that all of our practices and doors and methods are vehicles to activate and realize what is already the best inside of ourselves. So Shamanta practice is critical. But I'm not talking about shamanta that bypasses emotion. I'm talking about shamanta large enough to hold our emotional experience, large enough to hold our trauma, and large enough for me to hold your trauma and your pain, but also your beauty and your imagination and your possibility. Great engaged Buddhism for me means really going deep into our practice and teachings well enough to see how they can be applied to reconstructing our society. But what I know from my own experience of working and living around the world is you, if you don't do the work on construction and deconstruction in yourself, your social change will end up simply being a reactive model to oppression. And there needs to be a reaction to oppression, but a simple reaction to oppression is not enough. We have to create a new game, people, a new board on which to play out our lives for generations to come. This is about embodied practice. So I engaged Buddhism means first that my body is in the game. <laughs> my nervous system practices. My eyes, my ears, my hands, every all of my sensory world, including the sensory world of my mind, is a practice field, is a dharma hall, is an opportunity to cultivate one of the things I read about your website that impressed me so much. And it was the question of how the Buddhist wisdom can become civil. Because for me, that is at the heart of the question. And whether we call it Buddhism or not is not important to me. What is important to me is how we live with ourselves, among each other, between each other. So for me, the, the Brahma Veras, I don't see as something far away. I'm talking about the civility of the first Brahma Vera, which is loving kindness. Most of us humans recognize this experience, both in giving and receiving, without anything being religious about it. Then if you want to go really deep into loving kindness, that's possible. 
but that we're already wired genetically to be kind. We've only been conditioned not to be. We've been wired also genetically for compassion. There is research on that. There is research on kindness and from a scientific uh, point of view. We are, this, we carry the seed around in ourselves. It just hasn't been watered enough and cared for enough to grow into a mighty oak. It is there nevertheless. Shared joy, oh. And, and, and I was watching on the news the other day a group of baby elephants and all of a sudden I was so happy. They were playing and all of a sudden I could share in their joy. As humans, we have difficulty sharing in one another's joy. Because of the way our mind works, it's much easier to share in each other's jealousy without recognizing the wonder and the miracle of being your happiness can make me happy and I hope my happiness makes you happy and a society in which a system in which a context in which this quality of shared joy is fundamental if we're going to proceed to anything different than what we have now because what we have now in many ways is shared hate, not shared joy. It's the tragedy of our lives in this country. And of course, I could talk about other places, but I'm not at the moment. And equanimity, oh, our capacity for inclusivity is already inside of us, just like the sun is already inside of us and the earth. I marvel every day in my practice in nature how accepting the earth is of difference. Different, I have just 30 different kinds of birds hanging out outside in our little patio. There's birds of paradise, there's hummingbirds, there's hawks, there's, I mean, it's just, and the earth turns none away. This is equanimity. This is the space we need to cultivate in our hearts, in our minds, and in our bodies and transmit that energy and that thinking and language, which we're going to have to create some new language, fine, and our physical behavior to transmit that energy to one another and to others, even if they don't know they received it. It's one of the wonderful things about practice as a bodhisattva, as a person who cares with wisdom and compassion in an embodied way, you understand that you are, in your activities, you're creating energy that other people can feel and tap into and can activate their best energy. So in summary, shamanta for me right now means self-directed neuroplasticity, making a conscious choice to heal, repair, and enhance our nervous systems. We have been wounded. We have been damaged needlessly. It wasn't long ago I realized that being born is already traumatic and we don't need anything else <laughs> to, for us to experience trauma, but we live in a world that constantly, and in this land, we are trauma central. I'm working on a new book, I think, called One Nation Under Trauma. All these behaviors, all these guns, all these shootings are traumatic reactions to the world changing and the experience of powerlessness and greed for power, hatred for anything different than what one thinks is superior. Engage Buddhism here for me means cultivating solidarity between ourselves as people of color, especially. Because white, what, part of the strategy of white supremacy is to keep us apart. 
to keep us full of stereotypes and stories that exist between our actual human encounter so that we never get to touch the emptiness inside of each of us. And then engaged Buddhism here for me means being engaged while not being entangled. This, this is not so easy. We find this in our work, of course, and it's very easy to get entangled, caught up, trapped uh, by busyness, by ambition, by necessity. I'm not condemning any of those things. I'm just saying I take note in myself. Not to be entangled means that we protect our capacity for liberation even from our own mind and its domain so that we can enter and re-enter again and again the fray of healing and transformation in this world which is the Buddha Dharma embodied and that for me is a little summary of engaged Buddhism and how I understand the background of why I wrote the book I did, America's Racial Karma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward, for such an insightful talk. Um, just want to remind our um, attendees, um, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or type your question in the Q&A box. And I'll go through them um, as we... Um, <clears throat> um, Okay, so to start with, I want to take advantage of, um, as the organizer, to ask you my questions to start okay. us. Um, so I'm curious, why and why did you decide to get a PhD in Buddhist studies? I'm asking this because I know for sure, growing up in a Chan tradition, that anti-intellectualism is definitely mm. the mainstream. Not to say that we don't have intellectual right. traditions, but anti-intellectualism mm -hmm. is the main tradition. Mm -hmm. And scholars throughout history, mm -hmm. often the butt jokes in Chan mm -hmm. literatures and koans. Right. And American culture, I wouldn't say, I mean, I notice a very strong anti-intellectual right. trend also. Mm -hmm. But for, you, for me, you are very special because since your youth, you've been an activist. You've traveled around the world to help others. So how and why did you think scholarship would help with collective healing, collective care, and activism to bring us lasting social change? Um, thank, thank you for the question. And part of, part of it is, uh, based on my experience of being with different uh, Buddhist traditions in particular, but also Christian traditions, because before I practiced Buddhism like 24-7, I, I was involved in working in, in Rome with religious orders and teaching theology, etc. So that whole history comes to bear for me. Uh, I always thought study was very important. And in my religious community, prior to my Buddhist life, we studied every day. We practiced meditation every day. And so I just grew up with a discipline of doing things. I thought that what everybody, everybody should be doing. And I love to study, not in the sense of reading, but in the sense of learning. And then what I think I learned, I then try to do it and see what happens and that whole combination of uh, setting a practice trying it out learning and modifying and learning and modifying and growing really appealed to me uh, around the, about the buddhist tradition it was alive with practice the second thing that influenced me was a conversation i had with a tea in uh, Kaohsiung in Taiwan at Foguan Shan headquarters with Grandmaster Shen Yun. And he, he was talking about how important it is for 
scholarship, for art, for music. Um, I have to t tell you, I had no idea that Buddhism could manifest so many opportunities for people to enter. Uh, and so when I spent my time in Taiwan and other parts in China and Japan and Vietnam, I, I saw there are many, many ways to engage people to enter the practice. And, um, and that's, that's very, very important. And so I appreciated the, the awareness that there's several ways of getting up the mountain. Thank you so much. So learning and applying what we learn and learn more and then experience more. So that's the way the ever expanding cycle, which is, um, I mean, um, virtual cycle. Mm -hmm. um, there are many questions coming trading in now. Um, okay. Is it okay if I combine some of them together? Because I see some common sure. things. That'd be great. Um, the first big chunk of um, questions are race and racism related. Mm. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. okay. Well. America's racial karma. So you would expect that um, it's race related. So um, Julia asked, in nourishing the self-esteem of the intender, the thinking, speech, and behavior of racialized consciousness became um, animated in the hearts and minds of many. So that's a quote from your book. Mm. So her question is, do you think everyone will be able to become this kind of a racialized, achieve this racialized consciousness through uh, manifestation or do you think some people always stay ignorant? Okay. Um, can, I, can I just finish yeah, all please. five That's questions great. so you see mm -hmm. the common theme? So Alvin asked that um, the differences in ethnicity, customs, cultures between ethnic groups can easily lead to war. So um, many people have, although many people have different ideas, interests, beliefs, and even different relig uh, religions, uh, gender differences, age differences, they are close related. So that's kind of um, the, the dilemma, right? So racial strife causes national unrest and even war, but how can we eliminate ethnic discrimination, promote ethnic harmony? And Catherine's question um, is this. In the book, you talk about being seen as white by people in your own race, which is something many can relate to. How has this shaped your relationship with your culture? How do you think people can change their biases um, toward race or other minority groups instead of just tolerance toward these groups? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Christina's question. Um, Unfortunately, it is evident that in the 21st century, even recently, public racial dysfunction incidents such as the Atlanta spa shooting, where it employs violence and unconsciousness to discriminate against minorities, ex you know, exist racially. So therefore, how could the current generations, such as high school and college students, start healing and start public awareness on campus movements um, that define racial pre prejudice define racial equity and justification and treat racial traumas using Buddhism, Buddhist ethics. And Dylan's question is, how can we confront and come to terms with our own implicit bias and racism that is built in from our upbringing? Um, what is the most effective way of helping others confront theirs? As you were reading, I was thinking, oh, that sounds like a 21 day retreat. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do my best in a short time. So one is uh, on the curve, uh, one map of change in human behavior, whatever the context is, community, organization, religious institution, secular, it doesn't matter. You will have early adapters. These are people who got computers first. <laughs> then you will have never adapters at the other end. And these are people whose identity is tied to not changing. Their very meaning of life is wrapped up in saying no. We 
just I just saw a recent statistic this morning that 40 percent of a specific group in the United States is not going to take a vaccine. That's a never adapter. And then it's like 10 percent never adapters, 10 percent early adapters and like 80 percent of people in the middle can move in either direction depending on what is nourished in their minds, in their emotions and in their body systems. So for me, the work is to, we always are trying to, trying to get the never people <laughs> to change. What I've learned is don't waste your energy there. Put your energy on supporting uh, what my wife likes to call the lead birds in the flock. And of course, you know, when you watch those birds, they rotate, so none of them, <laughs> none of them burn out. But then also put energy into people in the middle, people who are late adapters, people who are seeking, people who are looking, because our news media here and everywhere does not tell us what's actually happening in the real world. We get peaks at moments of what's happening, but it is so difficult to find good news about human behavior uh, in the world. The, the being seen. Um, my story about uh, a short story about that this is when I realized. Afterwards, I realized how I had internalized suppression of myself. When I was very young and still in elementary school in my hometown, there was a radio show on math called Get the Answer Right or something like that. And you had to do all the math without pen or paper. And I got nominated by one of my teachers at my school to, and several other kids to be a part of this. And I remember it, part of the process for me of figuring out the answer and then deciding I shouldn't say it because I might be right. Because I didn't want to go back to where I lived in the inner city at that time being really good at math. It was not a helpful stereotype <laughs> to walk around with. And, and that was complicated when I brought home a cello because I was wanting to play the cello. So I, I, I think what I'm trying to say, we have got to learn, which we have been, how to, how to learn and live our lives outside of the framework someone else has created for us. Most Americans, to pick on Americans, have no idea why they have the images of black people they have the images of Asians they have, the images of Native Americans they have, the images of indigenous people, the images of Latino people. No idea how their minds have been conditioned. So for me, part of the work is creating programs and opportunities for people, including ourselves, to decondition our mind. But we also, in order to do that, we have to decondition our trauma. Otherwise, our mind gets hijacked and we can't think clearly, we can't make decisions, we can't even hear each other or even understand what we're saying to one another when our traumatic system is activated. And right now in this country, if there was some way to measure our, our level of activation, it would be a, like a tsunami. So learning third suggestion is learn skills of trauma resource. And so I, I went and studied uh, with an institution called the Trauma Resource Institute and learned six to nine basic skills that anybody can apply. We've taught it to children in Haiti to help other children during an earthquake. These are simple skills, relatively easy to do. And then um, part of my work with Lotus was to take those skills and create an online course called the Earth Gate that takes mindfulness and trauma resiliency and combines it into a, a systematic approach of taking care of ourselves. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I think recognizing what trauma is and how, how it shows up in the body, when it's happening to me, and it's just like all the teachings about our mind. 
Is our mind open or is it narrow? Is, is our mind confused or is it present? I mean, it's just about our body and mind. I think that's what's, what I'm trying to say. It's not either or. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very important to live our lives outside of fictions created by others. Mm. Um, and to learn skills of trauma resources. I think you just preempted one of the questions came later up from Abisai, how do we create self-healing from hypervigilance mm -hmm. and oppressive systems that created the trauma that's still present today. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a perfect answer for that question. Um, can I segue into the questions about um, education and daily life for college students? So um, three questions. Um, Amanda's question is, is this, a lot explores the advancement of Buddhism in America and how essentially some elements of it was transformed after its suppression. With that, how does a student like us continue to explore this religion and incorporate it into their lives without attending an organized service for it? In other words, how does an average American university student integrate Buddhism into their modern, busy lifestyle? And Charlotte's question, how do you think we can integrate more Buddhist practices and ideas into American education system? further how we how can we um, integrate it into a student's everyday lifestyle um actually this question is a little bit related but let me just ask it now earlier you spoke about embodying our energy into the community recently the surge in black lives matter has stirred up stirred up a lot of support particularly um, in the united states However, I feel like this solidarity has been quite unsatisfying. For instance, man, many people simply put up a black square on their Instagram. My question is this, what are some concrete ways people can go into the community and make a change on a daily basis, not just putting up a black square one day and then forgetting about issues in the community? Okay. Well, I, I think the first thing is about education. Um, because of America's longstanding anti-intellectualism, which came up earlier, uh, you cannot take for granted what people know. So, for example, I just had a conversation with someone who was in a sangha having a conversation about race, and someone got activated. Uh, actually, a white woman there got activated and felt like she was not being included and blah, blah. That's re response to trauma. Fear in her nervous system rose up. And without the skills of being able to recognize when fear is arising and watch fear come and go and to know what happens when we cling to fear. <laughs> and that's part of our practice. So for me, what I've been focusing on is how to bring the four foundations of mindfulness into my daily life. How do I do that? I start every morning with a self-guided meditation. The topic, you could use different ones. There are many, many available. But uh, I use the five remembrances as a daily morning practice. I actually do that before I get out of bed. So before my feet are on the floor, I have a contemplative state of mind. And then after, you know, showering and teeth and then practicing with, oh, wow, I got hot water. <laughs> and remembering how many people in the world have that. And so nourishing our gratitude every day for me is an important part of the practice because it's so easy in this culture to take things for granted. One another for granted, our resources for granted, our sustainable lives if we have them for granted. The third thing for me is I spend time um, after breakfast outside uh, with birds and other creatures, geckos and plants and trees and I have a conversation with them in my own way which they seem to be okay with 
And um, so I'm talking about practicing in the natural world. This is so very, just take a moment. I worked at a hospital in San Diego some years ago and I did walking meditation from the parking lot to my office. Nobody knew I was doing walking meditation. That didn't matter. What mattered was I paid attention to my precious steps. When I'm doing the dishes here at home, I practice while I am doing that by paying attention to only doing the dishes. Not what I'm going to do tomorrow, not what blah, blah, blah. And keeping my mind trained to, to concentrate with every little thing I do. So for me, that's how I integrate it into the practice, into my daily life. So for me, it's another way to say that is I realize that I am the Zendo. <laughs> I am the Dharma Hall. And so to live like that, to trust ourselves like that, to care for ourselves the same way our internal life we would care for the Dharma Hall where we sit, if, or temple space we sit in, or church space we sit in, mosque we sit in, and to understand the beauty of the energy of our ancestors that brought this to us, however perfect or however imperfect. For me, the challenge in, in, in Buddhism in America right now is getting us beyond the simple image that Buddhism is simply about becoming calm and comfortable with yourself. And that to me means someone really doesn't quite understand the first noble truth. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, Americans, we, we want to live in the third noble truth. <laughs> we don't want the first truth. We don't want the second truth. And we don't want the fourth truth. We want nirvana without going through our, our suffering and learning how we create suffering for ourselves and one another, without learning the causes of why we create systems of injustice, systems that actually promote sickness and criminality, etc. The suicide rate in the United States has never been higher. The latest research shows it's across every ethnic group. Second, it is rising and is expanding to younger and younger people. How not to recognize this? How not to talk about this? We have to bring our voice into recognition. Uh, in the early days of... Uh, pedagogy of the oppressed who I had a chance to, to be with for a little while uh, talked about doing things on the street get whatever get out <laughs> get outside when you can with zoom you can write your poems write your prose create your music do your art it's not that you have to stop doing what you're doing that's part of the beauty of mindfulness practice not the McMack practice but deep mindfulness practice that everything you think and do can open a door to your healing and transformation and liberation. And therefore, once you recognize that process, you can bring that process into society. That for me is engaged Buddhism, taking the Dharma as it is transforming us and asking what a school I worked with in Bangkok for three years. I was invited there uh, by a person who was attending a retreat we did at a Theravadan temple and she was the videographer and so at the end of the retreat she came up to me and said my family owns an international school and I want you to be a principal <laughs> to which I said right away I don't want to be a principal because <laughs> I know what that takes what role of responsibility and care but I said, I will consider consulting with you. So we worked for three years with this school who wanted to become the mindfulness center of education and demonstration of K through 12 in Bangkok. We were there three years, 
this seven years ago. I'm in touch with them every month. They are carrying on and they are creating new ways of bringing mindfulness practice into the classrooms, whether that is math, bringing it into physical education. I was there working with the sports teams also, brought it into golf, brought it into basketball. And it's so simple. That's why that's possible. And uh, so to really not, not get stuck in the image of the monk sitting on the mountain, though we all need that experience from time to time. But, but, but think of Shakyamuni walking through villages, visiting families, stopping wars. Think of this as engaged Buddhism. So for me, it's, it's, uh, it's my life. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's beautiful to be able to integrate mindfulness in the education system. But Thailand is a Buddhist majority country. Much uh, easier. Yeah, it's a little bit easier. Um, but USC is actually ha having this um, mindfulness training centers, right? Mindfulness courses. So it's called Mindful USC. Great. It's very um, desecu uh, very secularized kind mm -hmm. of like meditation mm -hmm. techniques, but all benefited from the Buddhist meditation yeah. tradition. And I understand um, that because of, you know, law in America, religion and state, et cetera, all those things. And parents, you know, freaked out over yoga. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, li we live in an environment where people have permission to freak out about anything. <laughs> yes. And that's the tragedy because it results in harm as well as ignorance. And, and um, so for me, the key to that is I never teach anywhere I'm not invited <laughs> and never try to introduce a program where there's not enough support at the center with people in power for it to happen. Okay, the students who want more mindfulness in education, maybe raise your voice, talk to the administration. Exactly. <laughs> And you can um, use other language for it. You can use, you know, self-directed development. You can create words as long as you're not confused about what it is you're trying to do. And that is, that is the art of being a bodhisattva, which is you create different ways to, for people to engage. Awesome. They don't have to be the same. They don't even have to be called the same thing as long as you're not confused as a bodhisattva about what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, sure. The next set of questions is actually related to sense of impatience, exhaustion, the problems we need to solve, and then the seeming smallness of the things we can do daily. Mm -hmm. So Diego asked this question, changing the game in which our lives play out sounds like a daunting and time consuming task. What would you say to someone who wants to make and see this change within their lifetime? What would you say to an impatient, socially engaged activist? Okay. And there's another question a little bit related. It's about exhaustion. <laughs> Jason Mapiri. As more incidents of racism continue to happen, how do you make time to take a mental break while remaining engaged with current events? So what, what I um, do for myself and what I recommend to people, there's a new book out on uh, African-American exhaustion. I forgot the title, but that I'm sure you also experience this exhaustion of you know, I, I'm almost don't want to look at the news because if I see one more thing that's so horrifying, so racist, so disrespectful for of human life that I would burst into flames. So I, 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 I mediate my encounter with the external world. This is called guarding the senses in Buddhist language. So really pay attention to what you take in, what information you take in, how much you can handle, suitable conversations with people. You know there are people on your phone right now, if you call them when the call's over, you won't feel so good. Don't call them all the time. So it's really paying attention to how we nourish the seeds in us 
of wholeness versus the seeds of fragmentation and fear and all of those are normal there's nothing wrong with being afraid um, some years ago my wife and I had our house bombed by a racist group and we had the good fortune to be able to go to Plum Village right away in France and spent a month or so with Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, he heard about what happened and called us in to his little space and quote you have every right to be angry about what happened to you but you do not have a right not to practice with your anger mm -hmm. the practitioner journey is to learn how to practice with every condition and that does not mean suppression or bypass it means wisdom in knowing what you can do when how much you can take when empathy is not the same thing as compassion empathy will burn out our nervous system starts to just shut down because it can't handle uh, during last year when the George Floyd event happened I, you know I cried for like three days I told my wife I didn't know I had too many so many tears were even available in the human human body and I was crying this morning over what's happening to her and all week about what's been happening to the Asian American community and so the poem I read to you came this morning after watching more news um, about quote unquote uh, your suffering and so focus on self-nourishment that's the first thing know what cares for you know how frequently you spend time with what cares for you in both your thoughts and your conversations and activities the second piece of this is this may come as not so pleasant news but in i learned many years ago through civil rights and I, mean, I can go through being chased by the Klan and all these other stories, but what I learned and relearn all the time is that if I die tomorrow and somehow come back uh, a thousand years from now, the world will still be a mess. And it will still be a mess because there are humans here. And everything humans create have a utopian flaw. <clears throat> and the question is, is that flaw grounded in greed, hatred, or delusion? Or is that flaw sincerely genuine in love and in care? But no system is perfect. But that's no excuse for what we have now. What we have now is hell. Don't be confused about what's happening to us and among us because but self-nourishment every day. How do I care for myself? How do I find joy? How do I find laughter? How do I find connection with other people who I can co-regulate with? This is a term from nervous system work. And, and first, my, our practice of meditation in whatever form is to help us self-regulate our nervous system. But we self-regulate so we can co-regulate with others. What we know about human beings is we're designed for co-regulation. And bad things happen to us as individuals when we cannot find co-regulation in our life. It could be a pet. It doesn't have to be another human, but some mammal, some experience of a living being that interacts with you beyond cognition. And so we have to learn together how to interact with other at deeper levels than simply language, though that's important. But this is also why sitting together in silence is important. So I can sit in silence in, on the little patio I have here. Um, in the chair here uh, in my little space uh, I take opportunities just take five take five minutes break things up so that you don't get on autopilot these are some of the ways I do it <clears throat>
what's important to know for me and the reason I keep doing what I'm doing in spite of the fact I know everything will not be the way I want but what I do know is if I don't put my little oar in the water if I don't put my little boat in the water what can happen will be different than if I do another way to say that is like history goes along like a river and those of us who have a vision inject that vision into the river now the river will go where it wants but it is forever changed because of what we put in it and that's how I see social change an ongoing well think of impermanence <laughs> in the Buddhist context social change is is impermanence itself it's nothing other than that of course it's also emptiness itself in that every change brings to bear and reveals the connections and causes that can result in clinging or letting go thank you so, so much don't be so no I, yeah patience impatience is my number one flaw <laughs> so and you know understand your motivation of your impatience get underneath the body sense of impatience and ask yourself why am I so impatient why does this matter and if I could do something concrete tomorrow with my impatience energy what would it be who would I feed who would I hold who would I counsel who would I support and so I have friends around the world and in the US working with daycare supporting elders etc all I know is turn outward with your stillness beautifully said thank you so much so we have the right to feel anger to feel impatient to feel exhausted but if we keep on practicing with our anger or impatience and our exhaustion we can with our intention number one change our own um consciousness by watering the seeds that we want to grow and by our very own action of transforming ourselves we are also putting into energy in that stream mm -hmm. of victory that might change its course might not but if you don't try will definitely not change anything so on that note i think um, we are running out of time okay um any parting word of wisdom for us um, yes, I, I, I think it's important to understand, this is something we already know, I'm just repeating. I think it's important to understand as someone who wants to make important changes in the world, and those can be small, those can be, we want water in this place. Maybe you live in Michigan, go help plant life is easily concrete if you look outside of yourself in terms of how you can uh, be helpful and then learn from that experience um, and cherish the ability to serve in whatever way whether that's a cup of tea um, a smile but nourish yourself nourish yourself nourish yourself our depletion and our exhaustion comes from 500 years of not being nourished. So it will take a while to feel full of goodness again. But it's all there already. Our practices to, to transform our perception and body sensation so we can recognize it in ourselves. And until we do, we can't recognize it in each other. Thank you. Um, okay, before we go, um, thank you, Dr. Ward, for sharing your wisdom with us. And I would like to thank again everyone for coming out here and for your wonderful questions that force us all to think harder. Um, and I want to thank you again for all those who made this event possible. That includes um, East Asian Studies Center Specialist Alexandria Ire, 
Eloriaga, and then our Associate Director Grace Liu and um, Program Officer Jasmine Yu and um, School of Religion Project Specialist John Terrell and Dr. Ward's assistants at Lotus Institute. So um, it's on that note, I wish you all a happy American Vishak Day. Thank you. Take good care. Be safe, be well. Thank you.